been in the oil business for 58 years and I ain't tired of it yet. Oil could fall to a nickel a barrel and I'd still be out there driving the back roads trying to talk some old rancher out of his mineral rights. I guess when you think about it, it's the driving I always liked the best. God Almighty, Texas is a beautiful place to drive in. Sometimes I'll pull over to the side of the road, turn off the ignition, just sit there looking at things, at the moon rising over the cap rock, at a jackrabbit skittering across the creosote flats, at the birds flying high above me. I don't even know what kind of damn birds they are, but it gives me a shiver to watch them sailing over wave after wave after wave of them and to hear their voices calling out to each other in the sky. I got to be careful about driving though these days cause I ain't exactly legal no more. They wouldn't renew my license when the last time I went down to the Department of Motor Vehicles. Said I was too old and too blind. Said I could take the bus. Well, I got news for them. I ain't taking no damn bus. But if you think I'm gonna stand up here and whine, you don't know C.L. Pettigrew Sr. I ain't about to give her up yet. I still keep an office down at the petroleum building in downtown Midland, and I got a deal about to come together any day now up in Bristow County. I've been through every boom and bust you can name. I was there for the goldsmith strike. I watched them drill the discovery well for the sprayberry field. I made a million dollars in Scurry County until I lost it all in the dry hole near La Mesa. But it was pretty near as much fun in those days. Losing money is making it. Because we were young. Seemed like Texas was young too. And every time a well come in, it was like the land whispering a secret in your ear. I've seen tornadoes and flash floods and every other damn thing. I've seen a man struck by lightning over on the eighth hole at the Lions Club Municipal Golf Course in Sweetwater. Now dead as a biscuit. Clothes on fire too. I was there in 48 when they opened the old Shamrock Hotel in Houston. Woo! Ah, that was a party. <laughs> I remember. There was a riot out in front of the hotel in the street. Everybody trying to get in and get a look at Dorothy Lamour. Oh, it broke my heart when they tore that old hotel down. What the hell are they going to tear down next? The Alamo? But like I said, I ain't complaining. I've had my share of the fancy hotels and wild parties. Two inch thick steaks, cold Mexican beer. It's the driving I can't give up. Roaring down a Texas highway in a big old Oldsmobile with the windows open and bugs splattering on the windshield and me feeling as wild and free as a Comanche Indian. I guess those were about the best days of my life. Those lease buying trips when I was a young land man with a big car and an expense account.
times now. There's one thing, one day that stands out as special. One day that I won't ever get out of my mind as long as I live. This would have been way back in the 40s, right after the war. I'd been at the courthouse in Floyd County and got a name of this old boy who lived alone on a hard scrabble ranch. And uh, the geologist told me he was sitting on a pool of oil as big as the Gulf of Mexico. They warned me at the ranch about this fella. <laughs> Said honk all the way up to the house because he was the sort that didn't like uh, surprises. But he is friendly enough. Just an old, old man with a bad eye and a myth missing thumb. He said he'd lost in a broken accident when he was a kid driving cattle up the good night loving trail. He wasn't half as honorary as the people at the courthouse said he'd be. Just lonely, really. Wife dead, children scattered. Nothing for him to do except listen to the stock report on the radio. We sat out there on his porch drinking orange soda pop. I listened to him talk about cattle diseases and the neighbor who'd been trying to steal his riparian rights for 40 years. And where the Jim Bowie really did hide all that silver up in San Saba like everybody said he did. And then he showed me his Arrowhead collection. I've never seen a collection like that. He had it all in shoe boxes. There must have been 300 shoe boxes stacked up on the floor of the front room alone. And every one of them fell to the top with arrowheads and spear points and scrapers and I don't know what all. Every one of these things he said come from his land. He had a rusty old sword from the Spanish days. You could still see the writing on the blade. On one side it said, Draw me not in anger. The other said, Sheave me not in shame. admired his arrowheads for an hour or so, I finally worked the conversation around to his mineral rights. And I told him I'd come out there and make him a rich man. He said he guessed he wouldn't mind that. He'd worked hard all his life and he figured the Lord owed him a little money for his trouble. over the contract and argued back and forth about royalties and bonus payments and such. When we got it all work, worked out, I handed him the pen, and just as he was about to sign, he said, there's one place that you can't drill. And I said, well, sir, but where, where's that? And he pointed on the map. Right here on top of this bluff. Well, <laughs> that was a problem because that's where the geologist, the geologist said the first well was going to go. And I said, uh, well, why, uh, why, why, why can't you do it? He said, I'm going to show you. I'll show you. And I said, all right, let's go. He said, but he shook his head and said, not now. 
wait until sunrise. There wasn't no use in arguing like an old, with an old man like that. Not if I wanted his signature on the lease. So I spent the night on an old army cot with a room full of shoeboxes. Then way before daylight, he woke me up and put me on a horse. We rode for an hour or more in the dark till we came out to that bluff. Sitting on his horse, that old man looked about 20 years younger. tied the horses to a mesquite bush and then I followed the old man as he walked along in the dark down through a big crevice in the rocks and out on the floor of Yamparica Canyon then we climbed up the, to this cave sitting there on the canyon wall wasn't deep. Just went back about 20 feet or so. When we turned around, we could see the sky growing light there in the east. said, I can't see nothing in here. What was you wanting to show me? He turned around with a perturbed look in his eye and said, hush up and wait. So I hushed and I waited. Pretty soon, the sun started to slip up over the horizon. I could hear the morning doves calling. And there were swallows flying out of the little mud nest at the top of the cave. Then this one ray of light started to travel across the plains, moving across the grass, along the floor of the canyon like it was looking for something. Finally, it came into the cave and was shining on a pile of rocks a few feet from where we were standing and lit it up like a Christmas tree. And then I saw it wasn't rocks. It was bones.
seemed that someone had piled a bunch of old jaw bones and set them up on end so that they made a kind of a platform. And on that platform was a skull from some animal that I'd never seen before. The skull was big and thick and flat and prehistoric looking. And it had two horns that swept out from either side like a longhorn steer. The skull's eye, eye sockets were as big as my fists and they were staring out toward the plains. I had the strange feeling that those empty eye holes were watching the sunrise just like I was. What the hell is that? I asked the old man. My God, son, that is an altar. said the skull had belonged to an old buffalo. Not the kind of buffalo we know about, but the kind that died out thousands and thousands of years ago. Way back when, the, in those times, that fella had chosen to climb up into this cave with this buffalo skull and carefully set it up on those jaw bones so it was looking east across the plains. Why do you suppose he did that, I asked. Why do you think? He said, looking out to where the sun was rising and the hawks were circling in the sky. They didn't have no First Baptist Church back in those days. Where else was you going to go if you wanted to do your worshiping? Besides, a sunrise is awful pretty here. I guess that old boy wanted buffalo to see it. tried all around it, but all we ever got was dry holes, and that old man died without a royalty at all. I 
come to this cafeteria for lunch pretty near every day, except for once or twice a year when one of the kids flies in for a visit. Girls behind the counter all know me and they treat me pretty good. They all pretend to flirt with me, but I tell them I ain't interested in any woman that wears a hairnet. <laughs> then I take my tray over to the corner, same table by the window. I eat my lunch, then my jello, then I usually take out a geologist report or a survey map, study it for a while. You don't want to get behind in this business. But my mind sometimes drifts. And these days, it drifts mostly to that old buffalo skull sitting there in that cave out in Floyd County. I keep thinking about that old boy who built that altar. He was a Texan like me, I guess. Though it was a hell of a lot different place back then. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it's the same. Maybe all these cities, Taco Bell, Dairy Queen, outlet malls, don't have a thing in the world to do with Texas. Texas is what connects me to that prehistoric fella and that old rancher and that dead buffalo. It's not just the place we live in. It's the place that lives in us. Even after we're dead and looking toward the sun with empty eyes
Todd. Okay. Todd, come on up there. And Stephen, come on up there. Stephen, Todd. Folks, uh, one person that was a vital part of this show that uh, I didn't mention earlier is a keyboard player, Mark Sanders. Wonderful job. Thank you, Mark. I'm on, I'm on a step aside here. Hey, okay, Todd just told me Mark is from Albany. Man, I'm glad to keep this in. Well, thank you for being here and helping. I, I don't think they want to listen to me, Stephen. Good to see you up here, Todd, Mark. Barry, thank you so much. Well, I appreciate it. This this is a this is a wonderful piece, and it works very well with a full orchestra. But it works some in some ways even better with a piano if you got Mark playing. But it's a it's a wonderful piece, wonderful collaboration between these two guys here, and uh, I feel very lucky to have been in the in the first performance of it. There's been been some since, but I hadn't been able to do them. But I'm glad to be back now. It's been 11 years since I did this, and I'm glad I'm back. We have a we have up here the poster from our first performance 11 years ago. Uh, Steve, Barry, and I standing next to each other. You can see how we how we haven't changed a bit. <laughs> if you want to look at that poster, but if I, I mean, if I was to add anything, uh, the short story came first, uh, and Buffalo Alter, uh, the short story by Stephen Harrigan, it's actually a story about uh, a true event that ha that happened in Caprock Canyon State Park. If you ever visit that park, you'll uh, when you go into the visitor center, you'll see 